Hey, what's up, everybody? We are continuing our discussion of classic theories of development. And eventually on Friday, we will address contemporary theories. Now, you may have noticed that the reading for this week is somewhat technical. It's written from like a more mathematical and econometric point of view. And that's great because in this class, we're interested in, in politics and economics. And so far, as you've seen, we can supplement any discussion of an economic theory with insights about politics and how institutions or policies or political actors might affect the developmental trajectory of any given country. And so far, we've done that with the case of China. We've talked about how peculiar characteristics of China, like authoritarian government, and the absence of really any form of, of competitive elections means that it's a mismatch with uh, Rosto's original insight or idea about the, the political and economic stages. Remember that he expected institutional innovations and modernization and eventually modern uh, democratic government. And so the point of that was to show you that politics matters a great deal and politics doesn't always align with the economic development trajectory that it unfolds in a given country. And so we wanna understand how actors, institutions and policies fit or don't fit with development. And so we'll continue to discuss some of these classic theories and today we'll focus on dependency theory, but first we'll address the structural change models that relate closely to the stages of growth theory model uh, but focus instead on, on the mechanism of development. But again, you'll see that we'll do so by thinking about the role of politics and how policies, institutions, and actors influence the process. And so the reading that we did, while economic, also is conducive to a more political analysis if we think about how a political perspective might change what we we view as the, the value or the, the, the way that the theory works. Okay, so the structural change models begin with a similar assumption. Yes, all societies develop through a series of stages. In this regard, they agree with the Rosto stages of growth theory model, which envisions this series of phases that constitute the process of development. But what's unique <clears throat> about these approaches is that they view the economy in terms of a series of sectors or structures. And as societies move through these stages or develop through these stages, the size of the structures or the, the relative structures themselves begin to change and evolve. And in this way, the structural change models focus on the mechanism of development and the mechanism whereby societies develop. In that mechanism is the sizes of the economic sectors. And for simplification purposes, we're gonna think of this transformation in terms of three sectors. And these three sectors are normally the foundation for any structural change model. The agricultural sector, the, indus the industrial sector, manufacturing, and et cetera, and then the service sector. Now, when we talk about the size of these sectors, we're really talking about the share of labor employed in those sectors. And so, from the perspective of a structural change model, we differentiate between um, an immature or a sort of young or primitive society. Now, bear with us here. This is language from the, the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And so it's dated to say the very least, but this is the language that they often used. We distinguish between an immature society and then a, a mature or a sort of more developed society. And in an immature society, much of the society is employed in agriculture. They're working in the fields and they're producing commodities for trade or export, 
uh, or any kind of activity, but they're primarily employed in agriculture. There's only a small fraction of employed labor employed in industry. Factories are probably very small and not numerous and their total output is a, a very small share of the overall economy. And then there's also a very small service sector, meaning a very, very small share of, of labor is employed in the service sector. Now in a mature society, one that has undergone this transformation or this process of development, we really have sort of the reverse. You have a very small share of labor employed in agriculture you have a very large or a relatively large share of labor employed in industry, manufacturing, factories, et cetera. And then you have a relatively large share of labor employed in the service sector. And this transformation, this change in the sizes of the economic sectors constitutes the structural change involved in the process of development the shift from an underdeveloped to a developed society. And so this is a shift from agriculture to manufacturing and services. This can be conceived of in terms of a transition or a transformation. Rostow's stages of growth theory envisions a number of different stages. Structural change models by contrast really envision a single transition, but one that involves changes along three dimensions perhaps more depending upon how sophisticated the, mo the model is. In our case, we begin and we work with a relatively simple model, but one that captures the economy generally, agriculture, industry, and service. So the central implication of these models to be very precise and to state clearly what we mean by theory of development emphasizing structural change the central implication is that there should be a strong relationship between the sizes of the agricultural, industrial, and service sectors and how developed a country is. The smaller the share of labor employed in agriculture, the larger the share employed in industry and the larger share employed in, in service, the more developed a country will be. Conversely, the more employed who are employed in agriculture when there are fewer employed in industry and fewer in service, the country will be less developed. Now this is very, very general, right? But we're talking about some general relationships and these structural change models operate at a relatively large or high scope of aggregation. So in this case, we're talking about three key sectors. And if we were to examine the change in the size of these sectors, this is what these models predict. We would expect to find that as these sectors change in size, so too do the development indicators that we discussed in previous weeks change as well. And so this is the central implication. We could observe this in a variety of different ways, uh, but in general, this is the expectation. Now, the empirical record is more complicated. And as these things often are, it's, um, it's not a one size fits all story and I'll go into some detail, but before we get there, it's worth noting that the proponents of these models like Rostow himself insisted that all countries undergo the same changes on the road to development. This is a universal process. And how couldn't it be if it was a theoretical model that was designed to explain development? But that's what's noteworthy about these models. They're not just theories, they're also prescriptions. And so that's what makes development theory and practice important to think of in terms of not just theory, but also politics. And so from the perspective of these thinkers, countries need to focus on changing the sizes of the sectors in the economy and specifically in shifting labor from agriculture to industry and to services. And these changes constitute the road to development. And by implication, the proponents of these models say and said, underdeveloped countries just have not undergone these changes yet. This sequence or this set of structural transformations is universal. 
in countries that are underdeveloped simply by extension have not undergone that, that set of, of changes and haven't taken that set of steps. And more specifically, they went even further and said that Latin America, Asia and Africa in the 1950s and 60s are just primitive Europe's or they're sort of like Europe just at an earlier stage of development in the sense that the expectation or the insight or the idea here was that larger shares of the population were still employed in agriculture and fewer were employed in industry and services. In particular, this label was applied to Africa where the rather cynical and, 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 and simple and, and racist view of, of less productive tribal people engaged in, in menial agriculture really predominated. But what was curious about this was that they would apply the same idea to Latin America. It wasn't enough to reduce the story of Africa to this relatively um, simple and, and over-exaggerated form. They also would argue that Latin America was another primitive Europe, but that was a confusing point because countries like Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and Venezuela had already industrialized by then. In fact, those countries were early industrializers by developing world standards. And in fact, Argentina was among the richest countries in the entire world in the 1910s due to lucrative exports of, of cattle and, and other commodities. Of course, interestingly enough, that, that uh, prosperity was due in large part to those exports of cattle, but even so, Argentina was industrialized by then at the time. They, they had a very extensive industrial and formation as did Chile in Argentina. And so in reality, in practice, the model hasn't always fit neatly with the empirical record. And in some ways it, it, it badly oversimplifies the actual story of development in some of these cases. Now, nevertheless, there is some use value to thinking about development in terms of a series of, of structural changes that ultimately result in a shift in labor from agriculture to industry and services. <clears throat> it's undeniable, for example, that the most developing, the most developed countries and, and even, even developing countries have begun and, and continued this rapid decline in employment in agriculture. So just take a look at this data from 1300 to 2012 for Italy, France, the Netherlands, England, and Poland. And you see that there's been an enormous decline in the share of the labor force working in agriculture, beginning at as high as 76% in Poland in 1400 and falling as low as 1.2% in England in 2012. It's undeniable that the process of development does involve, does involve a sort of transition from agriculture to industry and to services. And we can even take a look at a visualization that helps to put this in perspective, which I'll open right now. So what we're looking at here is the number of people employed in agriculture since 1800, 1801 to 2015. And this is for Japan, the United States, South Korea, Spain, France, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Finland, Sweden, and Belgium. And these countries are noteworthy to look at because these are countries that ostensibly have completed this process of structural change that is characterized by the transition from agriculture to industry and services. So those countries that have completed the process should exhibit the largest change in, in number of people employed in agriculture. So let's take a look at the visualization. <clears throat> 
and see if that is in fact the case. So it, it's interesting because you can see that it's not necessarily a linear process. Notice that in those early years, there were increases in some decades in the proportion employed in, in agriculture, but that was actually a temporary process because by the 2000s, as you can see, there is a clear pattern of more than a half century of decline in people employed in agriculture. Let's watch it again. Notice that at first there's sort of an increase and it appears as though initially before rapid industrialization, much economic activity did take place in agriculture in these places. And that's what we expect. That's what we expect based on the structural change model. And you can see that, that consistent with our expectations, there is quite a, a transformation in the share of labor employed in agriculture. And it's neat to think about the, um, here's another way to look at it. Let's take a look at this. This is from 1991 to 2017. It shows you that in some areas of the developing world, including Africa, there is some change, um, but it's not a substantial change. And of course, as you know, development is a process that unfolds over time. And so 1991 to 2017 may not give us a window of time that's adequate to, to really see in detail those changes. Here's land ownership by women and share of agricultural landowners who are female. Agricultural productivity is also an interesting data point to look at. Anyway, there's a lot of inf interesting information that we could examine to try to assess the importance of structural change as a process. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that even if this is an over oversimplification of economic development, there's still an important role for a transformation in the, the share of, of labor employed in different sectors. Let's take a look at the chat because someone has commented. Karen says, so would agriculture be a, a characteristic of underdevelopment when, when labeling a country? So when we talk about developing world and when we talk about developing countries, one characteristic may be low industrialization that usually implies that most workers are employed in agriculture or that agriculture is still the main sector in the economy. So more or less that might be a good characteristic, but I would actually shy away from using that as an indicator or as a characteristic because that's really more of part of the model of trying to explain underdevelopment from this perspective. I think that our indicators for, for development are more useful in that regard. So. GDP, GDP per capita, Gini uh, index and Gini coefficient. Some of these variables that get at income and get, get at the experience of, of ordinary people. But of course, if we get into the details, it is true that, that most developing countries are primarily agricultural economies still. And, and it's notable moreover to point out that there are virtually no agrarian democracies. It appears to be the case that democracy not only corresponds with income levels, but, but industrialization in particular appears to be linked with, with political democracy. You might be hearing the um, vacuum cleaner in the hall of my building in the background. I apologize about that. It's the, um, the world we live in. We gotta deal with this every day. And I'm sure that many of you are, are also struggling from, from time to time to cope with some of the challenges of working from home. But this is where we are, and I'm gonna pause here for just a moment. Now, let's get into some cases and take a look at economic growth and development in different African countries and take a look in particular at the kinds of commodities, the kinds of goods or services that they produce. Now remember what expectations we come into this with. We're expecting to find 
a relationship between the sizes of the agricultural, industrial, and service sectors in the overall development of a country. And we know already that African countries by and large are less developed, relatively underdeveloped compared to other parts of the developing world and particularly compared to the advanced countries as we've categorized them. So we come into this knowing that, that Africa remains relatively less developed. We wanna think about how well an emphasis on structural change in sectors can help to explain this, this relative underdevelopment. Growth, falling poverty levels and foreign investment have all contributed to Africa's economic development. Several countries in particular are leading the way. Morocco is one of the continent's commercial hubs. It was Africa's leading fish producer in 2014 and hopes to make fishing one of the pillars of its economy. Tourism is another key industry. The Ivory Coast is the world's number one producer of cocoa and cashew nuts. It's also Africa's largest producer of bananas, second largest producer of palm oil, and third for cotton and coffee. Ghana has seen poverty halved in 20 years with exports of gold, cocoa, and oil, explaining its vigorous economic growth. Nigeria is Africa's most populous country and has the continent's largest economy. It's also the largest oil producer in Africa and the eighth largest in the world. Agriculture, information technology, commerce and services are also driving economic expansion. Angola is Africa's second largest oil producer. Growth has also been boosted by the country's thriving diamond industry. South Africa is the continent's most industrialized country. Economic development is largely due to the exportation of natural resources like gold, platinum, diamonds and coal, together with a powerful service sector. Johannesburg's stock exchange is the largest by market capitalization in the African continent. Kenya is the wealthiest country in East Africa. Tourism is a key resource together with agriculture. The country is also a hub for mobile communications and technology and a growing base for subsidiaries of firms like Intel, Google and Microsoft. Okay, so after watching that video, how well does a structural change model explain or fit the African development experience? With, were there any patterns that you noticed or do you see any patterns that would seem to support or undermine the theory that change in the sizes of the sectors drive development? You can tell me in a direct message or you can tell us uh, over the microphone if you want, but I think actually let's just hear from anyone who wants to comment. Tell me a direct message and I'll respond if I can. We've got a small enough class that I can engage with all of you. Professor, what was the question again? So the question is how well does the structural change model explain the development situation in these African countries that are discussed in the video? Do you see a relationship between the types of sectors that make up the economy and that are the biggest and how developed the countries are? So what I saw from the video was that the Ivory Coast would be an immature, uh, an immature society versus Ghana because of their uh, advancement in technology, was it? Or that yeah. that was a large of part of their economy. Services. Mm -hmm. Services. Okay. Yeah. So the, uh, Ghana would be a mature society then. So there's some variation, right? Some of these countries are more commodity driven in terms of how they generate their income, natural resources. Many of them, largely agricultural, producing things like cacao, coffee. 
but some of them are increasingly in, in tech and services, financial services, tourism. And what, what did you notice? And this is a question for everyone. What did you notice about those countries that were increasingly in services, tourism, uh, the tech sector? What was different about those countries compared to the countries that were still mainly producing cacao or coffee or natural resources? That's right, Lewis. So Rady is picking up something interesting, noticing that most of those that are growing are near an ocean, are an ocean. And most of those economies base their development on simple industries like cacao or fish. And then they moved their industries or their economic power to more profitable industries that were based on local resources. Yeah, so there's a pattern here. All these countries, in essentially all countries, according to the theory of structural change and the empirical record, begin producing agricultural products and natural resources, primary commodities, right? Things like food or, uh, or oil or, or minerals, whatever, whatever they have and whatever they can make. And they produce these items as much as they can and they generate as much income as they can. And then they invest their savings in new technologies or new sectors that help to industrialize the economy. And, and gradually there's sort of a, an investment of income in new emerging sectors in a shift towards services and more high value added industries begins to emerge. And this is sort of the pattern in Africa and elsewhere. And this is the nature of a structural change model, an emphasis on this, this change in the size of the sectors. But what's noteworthy about Africa is that even in those, those richer countries or those more developed countries, they're still relatively early on in the development of some of these, these sectors, these service and industrial sectors. Uh, whereas in Latin American countries, they industrialized earlier on, and arguably, you might say that some of them are, are, are de-developing or, or regressing compared to some of their earlier growth. Uh, Lucas says, I do see relationships between the model and the economic structure of developing countries in Africa. The video mentioned that Africa's main re revenues come from exporting natural resources like metals and diamonds. Right, absolutely. And it's, it's important to note that Exporting those natural resources can be very, very uh, lucrative and profitable during periods that we would characterize as commodity booms, which would, would basically relate to the period between the early 2000s and the mid 2000s when China and other large consumers of natural resources expanded and grew at a rapid rate and purchased and bought up a lot of these natural resources exported by African countries. So those countries generated a lot of foreign exchange and revenue and income during the commodity boom. And some of them like Botswana, although that country is not mentioned here, have increasingly invested those revenues and that income in new, in new industries, in new capital. And, and they're undertaking a process of development that's, that's sectoral and that is, is driven by this kind of logic, this sort of sectoral logic. And so what I want you to notice here is that even though all of these models have their limitations and all of them uh, kind of run aground eventually when you examine the details of specific cases, they also shed light on the reality on the ground in, in, in many places, at least part of the reality. And taken together, they might tell us a great deal about development if we consider, for example, 
that investments of income, sectoral change and sectoral transformation, if all of these different things together form part of the, the, the larger process. So let's watch a video by the World Bank. And I want you to pay attention to the kinds of prescriptions that the World Bank puts forward here in this video. And, and it's really a video about how tourism as a service sector can be harnessed by African countries to further transform and develop their economies and to, and to foster growth that can be shared widely uh, in society. And so this is really a, a video about development practice that is informed largely by this structural change theory that I'm, I'm discussing with you right now. So let's pay attention to what they talk about in this video, specifically as it relates to what governments can be doing to put in place policies that promote growth. So there's an important role for public policy. These transformations don't take place on, on their own. They don't take place in a vacuum. And more often, they require the aggressive firm direction of the state in specific agencies set up to pursue the objective of, of growth and development with the resources at their disposal. And so in Africa, the World Bank is arguing that governments need to set up agencies to promote tourism and promote the expansion of the tourism sector as part of this development process and the shift towards services, identifying tourism as really the potential comparative advantage or the, the thing that African countries can do better than anyone else in the way that they can create jobs and, and promote growth. And so it's, it's, it's obviously sort of, um, sort of a cheesy video, but it gives you a view of of this challenge in the, the considerations from the perspective of the World Bank, the way that they use theory and, and evidence and practice at the same time to address this, this question of development in, in Africa. Adolfo says, yeah, an interesting point of commodity versus service-based. Services may, may see seasonal high points, but can be more disrupted by, by COVID or weather. Yeah, but at the same time, commodity-based production has the obvious limit of these are finite resources and the business cycle can be vicious. At the end of every commodity boom, there's often a long downturn where prices fall radically and, and where governments haven't sufficiently diversified the economy, they can end up in debt and they can end up on the dole. But Interestingly, services also have a limit as, as well, Adolfo, because clearly things like a global pandemic don't bode well for services. And so this video was made before the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm, I'm imagining that 
some of the investments in tourism may be coming up a little bit short right now. The, the airline industry, for example, has been bailed out multiple times already by, by the US government just in the United States. I can't imagine what it's like uh, in, in some other places. So this is um, uh, something for you to think about. And in Adolfo says further, reminds me of that dependency cycle mentioned by the neo-colonial dependency models. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll actually get to that here in a moment when we talk about relationship, relationships of dependence and, and how they can affect development and, and how they sometimes may doom countries to underdevelopment permanently. So the question that I've posed to you so far is, do structural change models provide a good explanation of the development situation in Africa? Why or why not? And what we've sort of discussed is that there's sort of some truth here because many of the poorest countries in Africa remain largely reliant on commodity-based production and agriculture, exports of things like cacao or coffee or precious metals. And in this regard, they haven't reduced the share of labor employed in, in commodity or agricultural production. Many of the industries remain, infant industries are quite small. And to the extent that services have been promoted, it's been tourism, but that still remains a project. And so in some, in, in some ways, the model does a reasonably good job shedding light on the, the African experience. But what, what I would like to suggest to you is that much like the stages of growth theory model, the model doesn't pay sufficient attention to the role of politics. And, and why would it, frankly? It's a model of, of economic development formulated by economists. But what I'd suggest is that even so, there are important constraints or obstacles or impediments, just as well as, as catalysts and accelerants and, and, and supports to, to economic development and to sectoral change. And so these sectors don't just change even when the ingredients are right, and even when there's sufficient income to invest in, in new industries. There's political opposition and political support. There are actors with vested interests in the status quo or with the potential benefit in an alternative. And there are institutions that mediate and channel uh, authority and power and that sort of referee and structure the relationships between all of these different interest groups and some institutions may be more supportive of structural change and sectoral change than others. So for instance, you might argue that presidential systems, all else being equal, will be more resistant to sectoral change than parliamentary systems because there are additional veto points when there is independent survival of the president in the legislature as compared to a parliamentary system where there's there's a, a prime minister who is selected by the, the parliamentary majority. That's just one example. But you can imagine then how there is a role for public policies, for political actors, for, for political institutions. And in the, the video from the World Bank, they talked very, very candidly about the need for governments to coordinate the resources of the private sector and to incentivize the private sector to make land available, to change policies and institutions that uh, don't promote or foster investment, uh, change their public image as it, as, as it was put in, in one part of the video. All of these are things that are, are decided and done by governments. They are policies and objectives chosen by elected governments or unelected governments in many cases in Africa. And so these sectors themselves they require a whole bunch of changes and in institutional reforms uh, for them to be transformed in the way that, that they are. And, and so I would ask you before we continue, do you think that, that political actors and institutions and policies in Africa uh, are on the whole are promoting or are, are obstructing development? And I know that 
that we may have a limited experience or knowledge of the of the region but based on your experience or your knowledge do you think that politics in africa so far have have promoted or have, have hindered development if development is a process of structural change that requires changes in the size of the sectors Well, there's a good book on this topic called When Things Fell Apart. And that book is about how African leaders, and particularly ruling presidents, don't or haven't responded to incentives to uh, improve the economic and the the political situation in their country. The argument is that they don't have the incentive to because they're able to extract benefits for themselves and for a narrow group of supporters, regardless of the condition of the economy or the growth of the society. And the book is called When Things Fell Apart. And part of the argument is that political actors, in particular, these ruling presidents who are often sort of warlord or clan-like leaders within their respective group, uh, and that institutions of authoritarianism in public policies that are often distorted have worked against development and have worked against the promotion of, of policies and, and, and development priorities, particularly because they've made it possible for clientelistic leaders and authoritarian leaders to line their pockets at the expense of the, of the wider society. And I would suggest that, you know, even if you don't know much about the model, this model, if we accept that politics has to play a role, would seem to suggest that politics has worked against sectoral change because the model would suggest that African countries remain relatively agricultural and commodity based in terms of the composition of their economy. And if that's the case, well, there should have been or probably were some impediments or some obstacles to that transformation, in addition to some of the obvious economic limitations that the model identifies. So let me take a look at the chat here because I think some of you commented. So Rady says the government, the video mentioned the government promoting the tourism industry. So I would say the government is supporting the transition from commodity to service-based economies. Some of them are, some of them are. And Yelly says, I feel that there might be a problem on political rights, the lack of access to promoting healthcare or other benefits in the regions. So social policy is sometimes lagged behind, behind economic policy. Let's shift our attention to the next classic theory of development. And this is what we call dependency theory. And dependency theory stands out because it is overtly political. If Rostow's stages of growth theory and the sectoral change models aren't very political, if they don't really capture the political variables that might support or impede development, dependency theory does. It's quite overt in its emphasis on power relations and on politics, even if it's ultimately just talking about economic relationships. It's the relationships that it captures, dependency theory, that, that are political. And I'll stop with the preamble and I'll get into more detail about, about what I mean. Dependency theory, is a 
an idea that says that the development or the underdevelopment of a country depends on its historical insertion into the global economy. And specifically, dependency theory distinguishes between the periphery and the core. And it groups economies into either the periphery or the core. And it says that at a very early point in time, at the beginning of the historical development of the global economy, individual countries were inserted in either the periphery or the core. And their insertion in one of these two shaped their long-term development in turn. And this process of, of long-term dependent development uh, or, or sort of structured development gave way to the, to the development outcome that we see there today in that given country. And so everything is always in everywhere historical in a product of this insertion in the global economy at this particular point in time. And more specifically, if you're an economy in the core, you benefit from some other economy's loss or subordination to the periphery. So in other words, if you're in the core, you always have uh, an advantage over some peripheral country whose development is dependent upon yours and who you expand at the expense of. Now, if you're in the periphery, on the other hand, your economic growth and development is supported, is subordinated to the expansion of another's. And so it's sort of like those gears that turn together. The core countries are the large gear, the peripheral countries are the small gear. And as the large gear turns, the peripheral countries turn too, but they don't benefit as much as the core countries do from that same turning. And this is just a very abstract example and I'll go into more detail here in a moment about what I mean. But these relationships of dependence, and these relationships of subordination are key to dependency theory and the way that it envisions development as a, as a process that takes place inside some set of relationships. These relationships are economic, but they're also political in the sense that at the beginning of this historical process, the way in which a country was inserted depended upon their position relative to the other countries and their, their, their power or their influence at that time and, and their resources at that time. We have two more minutes and I'm not gonna go to the next slide. I'll talk a little bit more about Talk a little bit more about dependency theory. Dependency theory was actually developed by Brazilian economists. And the reason that dependency theory was developed by Latin American economists was because they had this overwhelming sense that the development of Brazil and, and other Latin American economies came at the expense or came at the advantage of the development of, of large Western economies. And so in Brazil, they were largely exporting primary products and agricultural goods. But what they noticed was that the terms of trade were uneven as they exported these primary products, the terms of trade declined. And so people spend a smaller and smaller share of their income on primary source and agricultural products as they make more money. They spend a larger share of their income on industrialized and finished goods. And in this regard, Brazilian development was dependent uh, or was was subject to, to uneven terms of trade. And so the, the Brazilian economists developed dependency theory. We're out of time, everybody.
Uh, we've only just begun with dependency theory. We'll finish up and address new theories on Friday. Uh, thanks everybody for being here and I'll see you on Friday. Professor, can you hear me? Yeah. I just want to say I'm sorry. I popped in and out of class a lot today. I live in a rural area that was heavily impacted.